The month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned him about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. But the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love, of love with those who love him and keep his, and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you, day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we, we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant, Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant, Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, who you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in, rever in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. I asked them about the Jews who had returned here from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. Thank you, Ingrid. So there were five crucial things that you, you all reviewed in the homework. And one was what things are not going well. Another one was why is there trouble and disgrace? I know those are, that last word is a little bit drastic, trouble and disgrace. But it's really, I would translate it to modern times, why are you still walking in shame? When were the walls turned, uh, torn down? Where were the gates destroyed by fire? So those, were, those are very important things that we discussed last week. And as I was sharing with someone today, next week, if once you start requesting the Facebook, and I'll be adding you guys on the Ashes to Fire page, you guys are going to see last week's um, uh, class that, that was recorded. This one's being recorded as well. So it's very important that we understand there, there are crucial things here. On verse 9 it says, But if you return to me and obey my commands, you see there's a covenant right there. If, God is a God of if. Because I know he, would, he, loves, he, would, he loves to bless us. And I mean, which dad wouldn't want to give his daughter or his son whatever they ask, right? But if we give them everything continually, we're going to spoil them. And then they're not going to learn anything. They're not going to learn the value of money, the value of what it costs to get certain things, the value of taking care of what's given and handed over freely. And so God is the same way. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if, you, if, even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, so God is saying even no matter how far away you think you are from me, if you obey my commands, if you repent, if you come back to me, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as the dwelling for my name. So God is always, 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 he's always searching. It's amazing that he's always searching for the prodigal son. I mean, I was a prodigal son. Who, who, who here consider yourselves prodigals? Okay. He's always searching for that prodigal son or daughter. It's amazing. So as we return as the prodigal child, which is the end result of repentance and receiving forgiveness, does it still mean that when, when that father was on the road, now just picture this, the father never went after the prodigal son. Day and day the scripture says that he just simply would walk out every single day to the gate of his mansion and he would wait for his son. We don't know how much time. We don't know how many years, but all we know is that he would walk out and he would wait for him. 
walk out and wait for him. So just imagine this. When the sun does finally appear, filthy, smelly, and today's perspective would be someone maybe loaded on meth, on drugs, drunk, addicted, smelling terrible. And what the father does is he goes upstairs to his, to his room, brings down the tuxedo, puts it, gives the son the tuxedo, takes out his, his I don't know, let's make believe he won uh, a World Cup game or he won the Super Bowl. He gives him his ring his signet ring, and he puts it on the sun. And he restores him to that covenant. He restores him into the family. He, he restores, he restores his, his, his inherited rights. Imagine that. Remember what the son does? Dad, I want you to give him my money. And typically, we wait for somebody to die to get an inheritance, right? If we get an inheritance. No, but he was telling, hey, Dad, you know, give him my money. Well, he didn't earn the money. I mean, come on, this is dad's money. This is not your money. But he still gave it to him. But imagine that. He, he robes him up again. He restores him into the family with the name. He gives him the signet ring. And I bet you the father dies, he's going to get, inher he's going to get an inheritance again. Which is, to us, what's that inheritance? It's, it's heaven. It's heaven. So... But does that mean that he still didn't battle with his strongholds? We don't know what he got involved in. The Bible kind of gives us a hint. Maybe prostitution. Maybe, uh, obviously, drinking, drugs, uh, carousing, promiscuity. I mean, what, does a, what is there out there in the world that the world can offer that is going to be any good for us? Nothing. Now, with that mindset, knowing that he's dealing with strongholds, and, he's, and, he, and he doesn't really, just imagine that he, he knows he's forgiven, he knows he's brought back into covenant, he knows his inherit, inheritance rights have been restored, but the devil's lying to him. The devil's telling him, you don't deserve that, shame on you, how many women did you sleep around with? How many times did you get loaded with meth and cocaine and heroin? How many times did you, did you carouse with your friends and, and what and the things that you got involved in? Are you, are you sure you, you're saved? Are you sure you're restored into covenant? Are you sure this? Are you sure that? I mean, how many here, how many of us have actually battled with those thoughts? And we still do, and we will do. You want to know why? Because the enemy is keen in shooting those fiery darts. With the strongholds and the mindset that we developed in our deceptive freedom, because that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to give us a, a definition of a deception. Yeah, you're free, but you're still dealing with this. You're free, but you're still this. You're free, but you're still an addict. Remember, you went to the 12 steps. Once an addict, always an addict. And we said that that's not true. Because with the Holy Spirit, with the blood of Jesus, that is not true. We are restored. We are fully healed. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. That's a total contradiction of what they tell you that once an addict, always an addict. But remember that our foundation, why, why do we think in such a faulty way? Because we talked about that yesterday, last week. Our foundation is what we thought was right. Most of us are, well, not me, I'm sorry, but most of you, I'm hoping that you were raised with awesome parents, with good morals, with good values, and that foundation is a strong foundation. But it's still a faulty one if that foundation was not under Christ. Because there's still a lot of atheists and a lot of agnostics with very strong moral values, with very strong convictions of what is right and what is wrong. So. We talked about that our foundation was not built to code. Now, what, what if we understand that with Jesus, it is built to code? How do, what would that look like? Well, code, the C would be, the, the faulty code would be Christ absent in our lives. That would be the C for code. The O would be out of order, which is values and morals. So if you want to, if you want to kind of like write down the word code 
vertically, and right next to the, to the C, you would put Christ absent in our lives. Remember, we're talking about what the code looks like in a faulty foundation. The O would be out of order. And in parentheses, you could put values and morals. The D would be deceived by wrong thinking. And the E would be entertained by the world rather than built up. You guys see what's happening with the millennials and the centennials? Because the next generation after the millennials, now they're called, they called centennials. I mean, it's amazing. You go, I work for the school system as, as an IT tech, and I go into these classrooms in middle school and, and elementary, but, and these kids are, they go like in a withdrawal, kind of like a mode. It's like, like it's critical condition when, you, when they take those phones away from these kids. They literally go into an anger rage, an anger tantrum. And one of the teachers, I was walking into one of the classrooms, and one of these kids, middle school, said to the teacher, if you take my phone away, I'm going to punch you in the face. And the teacher said, go ahead. There's no respect for authority. So if we understand why the code is, is messed up, if we understand that there's Christ is absent in our lives, everything is out of order, we're deceived in this world by wrong thinking, and we're entertained by YouTube, by the games, by the telephone, by American Idol, nothing against the show, I watch it, but I don't follow who was who and what, who did this and what did that, and you hear the kids in schools, oh my God, did you hear that Justin Bieber is in Suicide Watch? <laughs> You know, whatever the media wants to sell, these kids, they don't know what the First Amendment is all about. They don't know what the, what the Bill of Rights is. They don't know who was the first president or the second president. But they know who Justin Bieber is, and they know who, who uh, Dr. Dre is, and they know who, uh, what, why um, Ariana Grande is in shock, and this and that, and, and they know this. And they know so much about what is being projected to them. And then we wonder why we're in the state that we're in. And I'm telling you as parents and grandparents, it is a moral responsibility to make sure that our grandkids and our kids and your, your sister's kids and your, your brother's kids and the neighbor's kids as best as you can, we don't have to preach the Word of God, but we, could, we, we definitely are obligated to show the Word of God. And how do we do that? People see us. Remember, I was, remember we talked about that how, how your, your children, your how your, how your family members, how your neighbors, they actually see, they see you. Remember how we, we learned in the first lesson that we are that trophy, that shiny trophy that God shows, he puts on the shelf, and he wants to show us off for his glory. So we need to understand that the code is wrong, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we build that foundation with the correct code. What would be the correct code? Christ in our lives, our morals and values in order, our, our priorities in order. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added, right? That's it right there. There's no magic formula. Instead of deceived by wrong thinking, delivered by wrong thinking. From, the, from wrong thinking, and instead of being entertained by the world, we should be encrusted in the Word of God. That is the correct code. Now, let, we mentioned strongholds. What is the definition of a stronghold? And today is going to seem more like a class than, than, than preaching, or, but because it's very important. Now we're diving into the meatloaf. Now we, the meatloaf came out of the oven. It's been taken out of the pan, and now we're slicing it. Now we're getting into it. This is what a definition of a stronghold is. It's a place that has been fortified to protect it against attack. That's what a stronghold is. All the bad things that have happened to us cause us to build walls to protect each other. And what do we protect ourselves from? From hurt? From being offended? From from being abused or continue to be abused, not realizing that we actually have built a high-end 
security system. Are we getting this? I was a victim of my own invention. I had a wall this thick, God knows how tall, because I'm protecting myself from being offended, from hurting others, from wrong thinking, and, I, and we build walls with good intentions. I know that each and every one of you have built a wall with a very good intention. You're tired of being hurt. That's a good intention. You're tired of being abused. That's another good reason. You're tired of people simply in the world mistreating you like you're a piece of garbage, so you build a wall. You want to protect yourself. But we're not what we don't realize is that now I'm trapped in those walls. And I forgot to put a door. Now I'm trapped in those doors. I mean, in that wall, not in the door. I am trapped in my own wall. When I wanted to protect myself from people hurting me, that was fine. But see, when somebody offends you, it's like, it's like when you're playing dodgeball. When you play dodgeball, you don't have a wall. You simply dodge it. That's the fun of the game. So when we get offended, we should be dodging those offenses instead of letting it thinking that we're going to protect ourselves from it. Because just like a drop of water, back in Vietnam, one of the main tortures was sitting somebody down a, on a chair, tying them down, and just let a drop of water drip, 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 and eventually it, it, would, it would drill the skull until it killed the person. That's torture. That's, that's verifiable. That's in what they used to do. With the wall... <laughs> When you, when instead of dodging your problems, instead of dodging the offenses, the balls are hitting you, and they're hitting you, and they're hitting you, and there, there's going to be a time where that wall is going to start to crumble down. So we have to understand that in a good intention of building a wall to protect myself and maybe protect my family, what I did is I actually trapped myself in there. What's another definition? It's a place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. That's a, that's a great big thick wall. Politics, religion, what I think versus what the Word of God says. We become set in our own ways, building those walls our way or no way. Our way or no way. Or Bubba, hit the highway. And guess what? As a man, <laughs> we're stubborn. We're that way. Guys, we, let's face it, it's our way or no way. That's a stronghold. Girls, some of you single girls, independent girls, for whatever reason, single moms, you have, you have built this to protect yourself, but at the same time, just ask the Holy Spirit to ask, you know, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, I built this wall, now is this wall something that now I'm trapped and now i got to break it down? And the Holy Spirit will help you demolish those walls. That is, that is what is so important that we understand. This, everything that's going on right now, everything that you're going through right now, as we started this journey, it's not my job to put my hands on you and deliver you from evil, because I'm not God. It's not my job to, to pull out spirits and deliver you from spirits. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's working in your hearts right now, and He's showing you, and it's really up to you to really let God work in your heart. You have to let Him work in your heart. Otherwise, people could come and pray for you, and you could be delivered over and over, and you want to you wanna know why you could be delivered over and over again? Because the Word says that when you're delivered, the house is clean, and if you don't take care of the house, seven words come back to it, possess the house again. So now, the next time, you're not dealing with seven, you're dealing with 14. And then the next one, you're not, you're not dealing with 14, you're dealing with 21. And then you clean the house again, but you didn't take care of the house again. So here we go again, the next seven come again. You know, think about it. It's kind of like the definition of insanity. It's trying to get something, a different outcome, doing the same thing over and over again. So when the house is clean, when we start to understand that God, God is peeling the onion, He's taking, okay, He delivered me from fear, 
What do I fill it in with? What's the opposite of fear? Faith. Because what does the word say? What does the word say about fear? What casts out fear? Perfect love. But you have to have faith to believe that God has that perfect love, don't we? So when, when, you're, when, you're, when you get delivered from fear, then the next peel of the onion is going to be something else. It could be phobia with uh, something stupid. With uh, uh, phobia to mice or to uh, snakes or whatever. It sounds funny, but people actually freak out when they see a snake, when they see uh, a spider. Those are phobias. Those are little strongholds. What are the big strongholds? Not trusting a guy ever again because my previous husband hurt me. What's the, what's the other one? Not trusting a, a woman again because she, she played me out and she took all my money and she took advantage of me. I'm never going to get married again. I'd rather live with, with somebody. See how the enemy entangles you? You don't want to get married because you got hurt, but you know, you still get entangled with somebody else because our human condition is we were made not to be alone. That's why God said, God said, this guy has way too much time on his hands. Let's make a woman for him. <laughs> now he's going to see what's coming. Right? So now Adam and Eve are running around in the garden, and then who came? Oh, these two are having way too much, too much time in their hands. I'm going to come and tell them, is it really true that God said that if you eat out of that tree, you, you would surely die? Is it really true? Is it really true that the definition of marriage is what the world, what the Word of God says? Is it really true that, that if you drink a couple of beers, nothing bad is going to happen? Because the problem is not the two beers. It's the third and the fourth and the fifth and the seventh. That's where the problem is. The problem is not the cup of wine. I don't condemn anyone who drinks a cup of wine here. That's your thing with God. But when we have one and two and three and four and five, that's where the problem really starts. So we have to understand that all of these little things start to creep in and they become stronghold. Now what does the word say a stronghold is? We talked about the definition that it's a place that has been fortified to protect us against attack, a place where a particular cause of belief is strongly defended or upheld. But what does the word of God say about this? In 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, this is what Paul says. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then here's the important thing. Bringing every thought, not this thought, not this, not that one on the left, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So what's going on here? How does Paul define it? It's an argument or high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what a stronghold is. So here we go again. I'm not going to get married, but I'm going to live with this woman. Why? It's a stronghold. I'm not going to put my name and go through a divorce and pay all that money and go to court and then I get sued for alimony and all this mumbo jumbo. Heck no. If it doesn't work out, I just simply pack my bags and leave. See, that's a stronghold right there. A stronghold is a point of operation from where Satan can keep the unbeliever captive or the believer incapacitated. Think about that. I'm going to say it again. A stronghold is a point of operation from where Satan can keep the unbeliever captive or the believer incapacitated. Think about it as a snake. It bites you. The venom slowly makes its way through the bloodstream to attack the, the brain. And then in the brain, it incapacitates all the, ner the nervous system in such a way that your organs slowly start to shut down. The snake part or the... No, no, the stronghold. Okay. A stronghold is a point of operation 
from where Satan can keep the unbeliever captive or the believer incapacitated. Now this is important. The unbeliever is the world, right? What is going on in the world? Chaos. Okay? Look at all the chaos in Venezuela with the, with the principality that's over that country right now. With the dictator. He doesn't care if his people are starving. He doesn't care that people are actually fighting because children are dying out of starvation and people who have cancer are dying because they, can, they don't get the proper medication. That's the unbeliever. So not only does he have the stronghold on the dictator to, to become a tyrant and oppress his own people, but now it's affecting the whole country. It's, it affects the whole country. That's the unbeliever. Let's think about our kids. If we don't monitor what they're viewing, they care more about Justin Bieber than about what the Word of God says. They care, they care more about what happened in the Super Bowl and the halftime show if they're, if they're in the teens and older than that than knowing what, what they need to turn in for school. Guys or gals, they're more about entertainment, about going to the bar, about having a good time, about who am I going to have a one night stand tonight with? What, how am I going to entertain myself with the boys? Come on boys, let's open a cold one. You know, we're more worried about that. That's the unbeliever. What Pastor was saying this Sunday about the Miller Lite commercial, where everyone's having a good time, but no one tells you what happens after you drink seven beers, right? And then if they miss whiskey with that, or if they, or if they, what's the game with the pong, beer pong, and they start playing beer pong, and then they really get trashed, then somebody dies. Alcohol poisoning. That's the unbeliever, right? Because the world is about entertainment. Now the believer is incapacitated. The believer is stung by that, by that snake. Slowly we get stung. Look at what seriously happened with Adam and Eve. Did really God say? Did really God say that surely you would die if you eat from that tree? Now here's the thing. Picture this. Remember, there's a tree of life, right? So imagine you... You're, you're hitting 97. You have a nice little wrinkle coming out over here. You know what? I'm just going to regenerate myself. Tree of life. And all of a sudden, plastic surgery. You're rejuvenated. Right? Tree of life. But God said, do not eat from the fruit of knowledge, of good and bad. So imagine you eating from that tree of knowledge, and then on top of it, you're eating from the tree of life. Now you're really messed up because now... Your thinking, your strongholds, your sinful life, now that's on going on forever. Now this is just me dwelling through the facts of those trees in the Garden of Eden. Uh, of Eden. What Satan wants to do is incapacitate you. He wants to make sure that you think the wrong way every single time. Because he knows that that way, you as a Christian, yeah, you're going to go to heaven. You accepted Jesus Christ into your heart. God said that he would write your, your name on the book in the book of life, but you know what? Your life as a Christian is going to be a very miserable one because you're going to live in shame, you're going to live in guilt, you're going to live re with regrets, you're continually going to dwell in your broken dreams, and if I could incapacitate you with those strongholds, with that wrong thinking, then you're never going to be doing what God wants you to do or what you've been called to do. Think about that as well. Because you're going to be scraping your knees. You get up, they start healing, you slip again, now you scrape the left knee. We talked about that. And you're continually scraping your knees. And remember, when your knees are done down to the bone, then you're going to probably fall on your elbows, and then on your elbows, and on your face. And when you don't have a life and a body left to fall on, then that's, that's it. You know? That's when people start thinking of suicide. That's when people start thinking of ODing. That's when people, when the Christian person that is enchained, incapacitated with all those wrong trains of thought, which is the stronghold, when he has you stung and numb, and he knows that he has you, I can't, he's not going to go to hell because I know he's born again. But I'm going to, sure make, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that his life on earth is going to be as useless and as miserable as it could possibly be. 
because I know the calling that, he, that that man has. I know the calling that woman has. I know what that child is destined to be. But I'm going to make sure those parents become abusive, become drug addicts, become alcoholics. So that child, which I know the potential because God already spoke it, doesn't get to that potential. Think about all these things. And then place yourself in that situation. A stronghold is a faulty or erroneous thinking pattern based on lies and deception. I want, I want everyone, including myself, to understand this. A stronghold is a faulty or erroneous thinking pattern based on lies and deception. And as I stated, deception is one of Satan's primary weapons. We have to understand what his weapons are. So we could counterattack in the same manner. That's what Jesus said, right? Are you hungry? Why don't you tell, turn these stones into bread? Jesus knew what, what's going on. He says, oh, I'm really sorry, man. I'm not going to do that. Because it's not just out of bread that man lives. It's out of the, it's out of the word of God. And then he took them over and to see the cities, right? To see the whole universe, to see the world. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you everything you want. Isn't that what the world tells, tells everyone? So he's always in the business of deceiving. Because it's the building blocks for a stronghold. Deception is the building block for a stronghold. Understand that. When you start, the problem is not the lie, okay? The problem is not, the problem wasn't the devil telling Eve, oh really, did he truly say that, you were, that if you eat from that tree you won't die? That wasn't the problem, but that was a lie. And she bit the bullet. And not only did she cause herself to be separated from God, but he brought Adam along. So we drag our children, we drag our wife, we drag whoever we not knowingly drag into a situation of deception, right? And then guess what happened? Then, then he creates a wedge and division because what happens after that? Oh, so it was the woman, the woman that you gave me is the one that gave me that food. I didn't do anything. It was that woman that you, give me back my, my rib, please. No. See how it goes? It's a chain reaction. So once he starts this deception and lying, he creates a stronghold, and then he starts cutting right through, causing division. What strongholds can do, it's, it causes us to think in ways which block us from God's best. Think about that. Because it's all lies. Everything is a lie. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I heard on a sermon I was listening to today on YouTube the same thing you just said, that... Um, Satan knows the future that God has for us. How does he know? Because we, we say it. No, oh, we say it. Yeah, others. think about it. It's a good question. She's asking, how does Satan know everything? Well, it's because we speak it. That's right. It's that simple. The good things and the bad things. He knows the good things. You've been called. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. But he also knows... The reason why you got called, you got saved, and you got redeemed. How did you get to that point of salvation? Well, I was at wit's end. I was going to OD. Okay? So he knows that you were a drug addict once upon a time. So he's going to use that against you once you're saved. And, oh, really? You're redeemed? Once an addict, always an addict. Remember that. That's not true. But he uses that. And I know there are a lot of things that... We learn in our Christian walk that there are things we shouldn't speak out, right? But sometimes it's kind of hard. It's a learning process. Like right now, Satan doesn't know what I'm thinking, but if I tell you guys what I'm thinking, then now he's going to know it all. He's not God. He's not everywhere. He doesn't know everything. And he's definitely not the strongest guy in town. So here we go. We're going to go through clusters or groups or, or certain... Def, not definitions, but certain things that could be potentially uh, strongholds. And I know this is very, this is very involved. That's why I, I went on and cut and paste, because this is the homework that you guys do at home. You, if you're married, you sit with your wife or your husband, and you pray, 
You don't have to do it tonight. If you feel that when you read through these clusters or groups of strongholds, that some of those things are bringing bad memories from the past and your husband or your wife doesn't know about those things from the past, then you pray to see if that's something that you feel confident enough to share with your spouse. Because this is about your freedom. This is about the strongholds that you start to identify. And if it has to get to the point where you pray and fast before you do this, then you pray and fast before you do this. Because remember what I told, uh, what I, what I told you. Yes, I'd be more than happy to lay hands on you and to pray for you. I don't have a problem with that. And my wife doesn't either. And, and the team that's with us doesn't, doesn't have an issue whatsoever with that. But again, if the house is clean and you guys don't take care of the house, then what we do is going to be, in quotes, useless. Because there is a part that you guys need to do, that I need to do, in order to maintain my freedom, in order to keep that freedom. Because remember what we talked about in the first, in the second class. God is interested in two things, holiness and character. And we have to do, what, we have to do whatever it takes. So the first cluster, just to, just to read a couple, is anger, hatred, malice, murder, temper, cursing, vengeance, retaliation. And then there's the whole array of other things that you guys see there. Cluster number two, fear. Fear of man. Fear of authority. Doubt. That's a big one. Unbelief. Remember what I shared with you guys? Yeah, God took care of all number 1 through 20, but number 25? He wasn't big enough for that one, so I kept that to myself. And we sometimes have unbelief that in that specific area, God will not heal me. Because there is unbelief. Let's go to cluster number 4. Shame. That's a huge one. Anger again, condemnation, disgrace, embarrassment, guilt, hatred, self-hatred. Sometimes we hate ourselves. That's a big one. Sometimes we have to forgive ourselves first before we even ask God to forgive us. Because sometimes our worst, our, our worst enemy is me. I am my worst enemy. We are sometimes way too tough on ourselves. Oh, no, no, no. I'll never go into that place because in that place they serve beer. Uh, yeah, I love the steak, but in that place they serve beer. No, 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 no. Why is that? Because the enemy is still tormenting you with your alcoholism if that's what you're dealing with. You're free from it. You have no place in it. And if you feel that that is so strong in your system, in your emotional system, and your emotional being, then don't even go there. But don't condemn others, see? Amen. Don't condemn others for wanting to go to, to a steakhouse and eat and drink whatever they want. That is their problem. We're not God's monitors. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not our job. But when I feel guilt and hatred and self-hate because of things that I've dealt with I have that when I still get triggered by those things that's the word I was looking for these these groups or clusters what I'm looking for is that the Holy Spirit reveals to each and every one of you what triggers whatever it is that it triggers because I don't have a problem with alcohol I really don't I don't have a problem with eating I love to eat, but I don't seek comfort in alcohol and food to soothe my soul. But I do know back in the world what caused me to be, to fall into the addiction I was in. I definitely know what the triggers are. One of them is depression. Because when I isolate myself, it's a whole mess when I, when I tend to isolate myself. And it's not just a guy thing. It's a human thing. So I want us to understand that these things that you read, that you're going through, something is going to go like 
right in your face because that's going to be a trigger. Okay? Lying, cheating, theft, deception, trickery, adultery, emotional adultery, denial. What about financial issues, financial lack, belief in poverty, robbing God by not tithing? Not believing in covenant blessings, greed, covetousness. You know that I dealt with. But this is this is one of my this is one of my areas right here, and I'll be transparent. I shared with you guys last week that even though my parents had a ton of money, there was always an issue with money in the house. My dad would steal from my mom, and my mom would steal from my dad. <laughs> Seriously. And guess what? I started stealing from both of them. I did. I didn't think it was wrong. Monkey see, monkey do. And all of a sudden I would come home with this fancy leather jacket or this, where'd you get money from that? I thought, I, I got it. <laughs> it's funny now, but the fact that I knew the combination to the safe and I would go into their business and I would take, do I would take money out and, and I don't know if they knew or didn't know, but I, I never got reprimanded for it. And I would literally see my parents stealing from each other. But there was never enough. See, that's the thing. There was never enough. There was never enough. We would go to a fancy restaurant. No, you can't eat that. Why? Well, because we can't afford it right now. It's on the budget. Yeah, but I saw $1,000 in your pocket the other night. You know, I dealt with those issues. Not believing that there's enough. And then, when I came to this country, I only came with $1,200 in my pocket. So my fear was always not having enough to provide for my family. And that messes with you because you always think that you don't have enough. So there's fear of tithing, because if I tithe here, then I can't pay the bill here. I had to get to the point where I would just put my finger on, on, on the mouse and I would go... Oh, it didn't go. I guess that wasn't meant to be. <laughs> but then there were times I literally would go like that and the, and the money would go. And I would go into panic attack. I would go into literally panic attack. I would have, I would have shortness of breath. I, how am I going to do this? I shouldn't have given God this money. Now what am I going to do? So we need to understand... What triggered all of this craziness, financially speaking? I was greedy, yes. But was I greedy because I wanted to just have and have? No. I was greedy because I would always think that I would never have enough for my family. Isn't that a, pardon my English, isn't that a screwed up way of thinking? <laughs> that you think that you're never going to have enough money to provide for your family so you don't give God what he needs or you don't give, well if I buy David these shoes that are $75 I can't pay the gas bill on this side <coughs> and then the devil plays with you because he's not going to open those doors you just gave him 10% of your earnings and it's been a slow painful process to understand that God could do more with my 90% than with, you know what I'm saying, 90% of my pocket, God could do more than my 100% if I don't give him anything. And, it, and it's a process, and it's a walk of faith. Addictions, alcohol, drugs, food, sugar, coffee, chocolate, <laughs> pornography, sex, flirting, Magazines, website, chat rooms, chat apps with strangers. You know how much, do you know how many of the millennials and the centennials are now wrapped up in the sexting thing? You, do you guys even know what sexting is? Yes. How many here do know what sexting is? Raise your hand. How many don't know what sexting is? Don't be, it's okay. Okay, basically it's taking a picture of yourself with no clothes on and sending it to somebody else. And this generation is so wrapped up in it, but politicians everywhere are doing it as well and they get in trouble. And they lose their jobs and their reputation. And th this, this generation, the kids don't understand that once they send that picture to somebody else 
And if that person is not smart enough to keep that picture to him, her, to him, herself or himself, and then they send it to, look at my, Mikey, look, this is what my girlfriend looks like. And he's 13, 14 years old. Well, guess what? Now you're, if you get caught, that's distribution of pornography, child pornography. Because the law is very strict on that. But see, we don't think of those things. The deception is, if it feels good, do it. If she looks good, why not share it with somebody else? If he looks good, why not share it with somebody else? And the thing is, we have to understand that kids this age, in elementary school, fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, it's going on, and the schools are not doing anything about it, only when they get caught. But see, adults do it as well. So chat rooms, chat apps, sexting, TV shows, movies, all that stuff, we have to, we have to understand, again, like, like I was telling you when, in, the, in the video, we must go to the root cause of the problem. What triggers me to get involved in that kind of craziness? It's really being accepted. That's what it really boils down to. If I'm sending pictures to somebody else, I want that approval. I want that acceptance. That's really what it boils down to. And, and the stronghold is, the more likes you get, the more accepted you are. And now we become addicted to social media, right? You, you wonder how these movie stars and these singers get like millions and millions of followers and a gazillion likes. I'm going to tell you a funny story. I, I, I do photography. My Instagram has not gone beyond 300 and 283 fo followers. And sometimes that frustrates the living daylights out of me. Because in my mind, there's this other guy that doesn't have good pictures compared to what I do, and he has 15,000. And one day the Holy Spirit said, you want to know why? You're good. I know you are. I taught you that talent. <laughs> That's what I didn't call I didn't call you to do that. So you're going to get frustrated because that's, and it's never, it's never gone over 280. Never. And I have like 700 posts. <laughs> 700 posts on my Instagram. Until one day I got it. And God told me, you're going to have to let go of that photography. It's not what I called you to do. You could enjoy it. You could still enjoy taking pictures, and if someone knows that you're a photographer and you want to do their wedding, that's fine and dandy. I'll bless you here and there every once in a while, but that's not what I called you. Cluster 8, sensuality, lust, fantasizing, coveting somebody else, premarital sex, adultery, emotional adultery, and I'll stop there. Depression, rejection, despair, helplessness. Hopelessness, sadness, self-pity, withdrawal, suicide, cutting, the next one, grief, sorrow, despair, heartbreak, agony, anguish. Eleven, mental instability, mental illness, compulsions, confusion, hysteria, paranoia, schizophrenia. Think, let's think about mental instability. Let's think about that for a moment. Because it's really a serious thing. And a lot of the lies is that you'll never be healed from that. That you'll always be dependent on some type of medication. Because that medication is going to be your chemical upper. So you won't kill yourself. So you won't go bonkers. But we have to understand that all of this is really demonic oppression. And that's why you have to go through this in a really serious way. And you have to tell the Holy Spirit, please show me. And don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Mental illness is not something to be ashamed of. Depression is not something to be ashamed of. If you're, if you're going through grief, for heaven's sake, we're, this hurts. This hurts. And this thing that pumps inside our hearts, our body, that hurts too. And God knows it. So don't grieve by yourself. If you're depressed, 
Talk to somebody. Pray with somebody. It's so important. If you're dealing with all these sensuality issues and you can't seem to shake them, find someone that you know that you could trust. That you really know because this is a really delicate area of anyone's life. Find someone that is mature, that is not going to judge you, and someone that could actually be an accountability person. Someone that you could go and say, you know what? Here's my cell phone. I need you to change the code. Because I can't seem to shake the, the itch to, to click on that phone. But you have to understand that what causes you to click, click, click is not the issue. That's the trigger. Behind that sensuality part of, of the clusters is grief, it's sorrow, it's mental illness, it's depression, it's low self-esteem. Think about that. A lot of those things take you to that place of being addicted to whatever it is. <laughs> the only reason why I call out and I call out and I call out the sexual part, it's because we have to understand that out of all the sins, the Bible says, that's the one that affects you out, out of your body. And it doesn't matter if you're married or if you're not married. Because it just tears you down. It destroys you from the inside out. And I'll be honest, I dealt with that situation when I was young. Very young. And I know what it is to almost want to commit suicide because you cannot shake that off. I'll be honest and transparent. Until finally, one day, the Holy Spirit showed me. He said, Juan, that's not the root cause of the problem. It's the trigger. What triggers it? What triggers your depression? What triggers that sexual addiction? What triggers wanting to go from 180 degrees to 90 degrees? What triggers it? Because once you identify what triggers it, then you are really going to be start going through that process of freedom. Because the next time you get that itch to click on something you're not supposed to be clicking, the next time you get that itch to go to a bar and take a drink, the next time you get that itch to punch a wall, because anger is another thing, right? If you think about all these issues, if you think about everything that, we've, that I've named, you know, one thing could lead to another. Depression could lead to anger. Anger could, could lead to a mental instability. Mental instability could lead you to do something crazy. You know what, I hate my wife, I'm not going to do this, and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go to the girly joint. Well, you, you, you decide to go to bed with one of those girls, right? Months down the road, you become sick. Guess what? Honey, I got AIDS. Remember that night? That fight that we really had, the night I punched in the wall? When I should have really prayed, when I really should have like really, really, really like changed myself to the house or, or locked myself in the car or, or done something drastic? But see, we have to understand that one thing will lead to another. And if we understand the triggers, we understand the root causes, then we're on the road to recovery. So don't believe the deception that you need that click, click, click because your wife doesn't like you, because your husband doesn't like you. You don't need the click, click, click. Gambling, that's another thing. Okay, let's go away from from the pornography part. Let's go into gambling. Well, I got a couple of dollars here. They're not going to hurt. That's another compulsion. That's another addiction. That's a whole different thing. What about eating? You think eating is funny? It's not funny. It's a serious thing. You know, when you talk to these, when you hear these, these people of how they eat and then they stick their fingers to throw up and, I mean, they're hurting their body. And some of them don't throw up. They just eat and eat and eat and eat. And obviously they're not going to get skinnier. They're going to get bigger. What triggers those eating disorders? Now, here's the good news, because we've talked about a lot, of the, a lot of the other stuff. What if I told you that there is a good stronghold? What if I told you there is a good one? Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Because when I saw it, it felt like, right in your face. Holy Spirit said, in your face. I got one for you. Second Samuel 22, verse 2. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. 
My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. Here's another one, Psalm 9.9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in the times of need or times of trouble. You think the devil is the only one who has his own little tricks up the sleeve, right? God is our stronghold. He is the only good, valid stronghold. Psalm 31, 2. Listen to me. Quickly deliver me. Be my protector and refuge. A stronghold where I can be safe. Here's another one. Psalm 46, 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, our refuge, our high tower. Now, if that doesn't cause you to applause and give God praise, then I don't know what it does. There is one good stronghold. It's God himself. Now, two of the main things of why a stronghold takes place in our lives. Remember, we talked about lies and deception. Number one... We see God incorrectly. And number two, you see yourself incorrectly. Can someone tell me the time? 804. 8.04? Okay. We have, to, we have to cut it because I know these things, are, these things are so important that we could take like a long time. And I have to respect your time. But the two things that are destructive are... One, you see God incorrectly, and two, you see yourself incorrectly. And we're going to have to start that next week, but we, we need to pray about these clusters, about these things that cause you to, tr to get triggered, okay? It could even be like... As a, as, a, as a single mom or a single dad, I think it's protecting your kids could be a, the enemy could use that to make you feel so insecure about so many things. I feel, I'm, I'm married and I feel insecure about so many things sometimes. Is my kid going to do this right? Is he going to make a good decision? I mean, I have to stay on top. And the Holy Spirit said one time, no, you know, you have to stay on top. I stay on top. You go on your knees. But please... Please, please pray, 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 pray as this week kicks in because it is so vitally important that we start to identify what those strongholds are, what those triggers are. Amen? I know it's a lot to cover and sometimes it's, it's critical, but I want us to come prepared next week to, to simply continue to let God work in your hearts. Amen? God bless you all.